there, you're with Bloomberg Quint. The sudden lockdown imposed in the wake of COVID-19 posed both a challenge and opportunity for India's health startups. Restricted access to diagnostic centers meant more patients embraced online consults and solutions. But limited imports meant broken supply chains that led to prices of raw materials in the, in the domestic markets to skyrocket. So how has India's health startup ecosystem coped with these challenges and stepped up their game? In this special series on Bloomberg Quint, we are speaking to businesses to understand how India's health market has evolved in the last few months and where do we go from here. For every 1 million people in India, there are just three psychiatrists and even fewer psychologists. And that's as per the WHO report of 2015, mental health doctors Discontinuing patient appointments and getting prescription has compounded the problems of mental health patients. Add to that the stress and anxiety from job losses, loan defaults, and the general uncertainty as a result of this lockdown. COVID-19 has certainly not helped a set of society that was already underserved to begin with. To throw some light on the existing situation, I'm joined by Dr. Ashwin Nayak, founder of several healthcare startups, uh, Ashwin, welcome here on Bloomberg Quint. You founded uh, Mana Wellness, a mental health platform. You've also co-founded Vatsalya that works to provide affordable healthcare to rural areas. Uh, what's been your response? Uh, what's been the response to your mental wellness helpline so far and the outreach programs that you've been running through this lockdown? Thank you, Paiswani. Good to be here. Um, you're absolutely right. I think this entire pandemic has uh, not only exaggerated the deep gaps that we had in the mental health space, but also created a new kind of environment, you know, whether it is due to job losses or whether it is due to the, uh, the anxiety and stress of being in lockdown. So what we are seeing, you know, we started this mental health helpline uh, middle of April, it's called Let's Talk. It's a free service and uh, the way we have structured it is uh, it's a partnership with various NGOs who are working on uh, relief on the ground, uh, particularly for people who are impacted directly by uh, Corona. What we are seeing is there is a tremendous increase in the amount of stress and anxiety and people don't know where to go. Now, uh, if you look at the existing burden of mental health versus what has happened over the last two, three months, uh, various agencies have uh, seen that there is a 20 to 30 percent increase in the number of uh, calls, number of cases that have come. To them. One of the big challenges that we see is that this is not just restricted to the acute phase of the pandemic. Uh, the impact of this will uh, stick on for multiple months, multiple years. And this is not just because of the virus, but like you rightly said, the after effects of the virus, which is uh, loss of jobs, etc. Two areas that we are very much concerned about. One is the small businesses and the owners of small businesses and the employees of small businesses who are under tremendous stress, both financially and uh, you know in terms of their future. So we expect that the number of people who will be in distress in that community will increase tremendously. The second segment that we are worried about is adolescents and young people particularly people who are entering the job market for the first time. You've just finished your education, now looking to your first job, and you're entering probably the worst time in the history uh, to the job market. And that could have a tremendous impact uh, on their mental health and also their overall worldview. So these two areas we are completely um, sort of unprepared for. Uh, not to speak about the, uh, you know, we cannot ignore the migrant situation. I think that's an emerging problem. We have not yet seen the full-blown effect of what is happening after this uh, reverse migration happens. And we see that there will be lots of distress-related calls coming from uh, far-flung areas. And uh, we are in the process of supporting NGOs across the country to deal with this in the coming months and weeks. Okay, um, Ashwin, tell me this, this uh, you know, if I can call it telemedicine, this remote diagnosis certainly can't be easy, uh, especially for mental health patients where, you know, non-verbal cues are equally critical. Uh, and many psychiatric tests, I believe, are probably difficult to perform online. 
uh, the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences recommends in-person evaluation for new patients. Uh, how have uh, you know platforms like yourselves managed to overcome some of these challenges? Right. So there are three aspects to mental health. Right. One is the distress part of it. The second one is the psychiatric sort of prescription medicine type of it. And then the third one is counseling and therapy. Now, while we fully agree that people with serious clinical mental health conditions who need psychiatric care uh, will require some amount of physical interaction, I think there is a large amount of work that can be done remotely, either through telephone, either through video or other technologies. So uh, that is one part of this uh, answer. The second is, this is the reality. We have to find a way. We have to find a way to do all of these remotely. You know, maybe we have to build a new cadre of people. Uh, one of the things that we strongly believe is mental health issues will not be solved by having more psychiatrists or more counselors or more therapists. I think the imp uh, imperative is to train our primary health system to be able to uh, figure out how to uh, build capacity and uh, be able to diagnose and treat many of these issues on their own rather than depending on specialists. Okay, um, in terms of, like you said, that you'll have to sort of devise, uh, uh, you know, ways around this. Have you been able to come up with any concrete solutions? Are doctors open or comfortable prescribing prescriptions uh, when consults are happening online? Uh, yes, I think it's been a um, quite a long time since this was being pushed by uh, a bunch of companies to enable telemedicine, particularly in the context of mental health. But over the last two months, uh, obviously the need has improved um, and it has become acute. But more importantly, the regulations have been now tweaked to allow prescription writing uh, over internet, over a video call and on the phone, which is clearly helping doctors build confidence that this is something that they can do. I think the medical community is ready and able. It was just the fear of regulations not being conducive, which was preventing, preventing them. Um, Ashwin, this is a very broad question and I'm sure it varies from case to case, but how have you advised or, uh, you know, the doctors that are there on your platform advise people to cope with some of the issues that you uh, alluded to, uh, let's say issues related to confinement, loneliness, general uncertainty, and the general fatigue as well, right, of the lockdown where uh, you don't know that if this, this is the new normal in your life and, you know, how do you cope with all of this? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question, right? And, you know, if you think of it from the context of the doctors themselves, they are the most stressed and anxious group of people right now. You know, on one hand, they are battling COVID. On the other hand, they are seeing this increase in mental health uh, issues. What we believe is needed to be done right now is to create an environment where somebody who's in distress has the opportunity to be heard and understood. That's all we can do, right? This, this is not... Uh, we cannot possibly do the entire spectrum of mental health management as long as we create a space where people can call up, share their anxiety, and there's somebody to reassure them about, uh, you know, whether it is okay, whether it is not okay. That's all we can do. The second thing that we have seen, which has helped very much, is to focus on building routines rather than sort of ad hoc reactions to things that are happening. The lockdown and the aftermath of that is not under our control. So whichever way we could build routines in our lives has been very, very useful in addition to the traditional methods like meditation and mindfulness and things like that. Okay. Final question to you, Ashwin. You know, there was a mental health care bill of 2017 that sought to create an institutional capacity, oversight and standardized approach for mental health care. Uh, would we have been better prepared to deal with this uh, crisis uh, if we had all of this, and uh, are we too late to sort of uh, initiate that process at this stage? I don't think it's uh, any time that we bring a positive regulation like this, it's never too late. I think it might be the right time to get this in. We have been able to bring mental health into the limelight and also uh, focus on it as a, as a, uh, as a uh, focus strategy, I would say. The challenge really is in the way we have designed it, which is to focus on the institutional approach to care. We know we don't have enough doctors. We don't know. We know we don't have enough nurses. I think the 
the focus on regulating mental health coupled with community based approach is what we think is uh, needed at this point and not just rely on specialist doctors and uh, therapists all right ashwin thank you for uh, speaking to us about uh, your experiences in the last few months of the lockdown and uh, you know we hope that the government also sees this um, issue as a top priority and brings in the requisite institutional framework thank you for speaking with dr quint and thank you so much for watching thank you my pleasure